Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about medieval outlaws. This episode is about Eustace the Monk. We'll be covering Eustace's many careers, his early days as a monk and seneschal, how he declared war against his former master Count Renaud, then eventually fled to the coast to become a pirate king and took advantage of a civil war in England to become very rich before his power and his life were both ended at the Battle of Sandwich. Eustace the Monk was a younger son from a family of lesser below nobility, born sometime around the year 1170. Being a younger son, Eustace had a career in the church mapped out for him, so he took holy orders at a Benedictine monastery. While a monk, he became infamous for his foul language and gambling habits. Later on, storytellers claimed that Eustace learned black magic while a monk and used it during his outlaw career. That part of his life is almost certainly fanciful, but the idea wasn't silly to people at the time, as some monasteries devoted whole libraries to books of magic called the Queen of Sciences. Magic or not, Eustace left the monastery sometime around the year 1190 after the death of his father, who had probably been murdered by a rival nobleman named Han Freud de Hersingen. Eustace challenged Hanfroy to a duel, but since dueling is dangerous, he had a champion represent him, as did Hanfroy. After a bloody battle, Hanfroy's men won the day and he was declared innocent. Even though Eustace tried to appeal to the courts, they wouldn't let it go any further. Having decided that he enjoyed life outside the monastery more, Eustace abandoned any further effort to avenge his father and went to work as seneschal, or chief accountant, for Count Renaud of Boulogne. However, some years later, Eustace had a falling out with the count who accused him of mismanaging his estates. Again, Eustace appealed to the courts, but lost his nerve before the hearing and fled. The Count proclaimed that Eustace's flight was an admission of guilt, declared him an outlaw, and seized his land holdings. Forced to flee into the forest of Bolognay, Eustace waged a hit-and-run war against Count Renaud, robbing his tax collectors and burning his mills, then vanishing back into the woods. This time of his life would later become the subject of a 1284 prose work covering Eustace's life, The Romance of Eustace the Monk, which portrayed him as a Robin Hood-like figure, duping and tricking Count Renaud. In one episode, Eustace disguised himself as a mackerel seller and sold some fish to the Count, and as the Count reached for his fish, Eustace yanked him off his mount by the arm and then rode off while leaving the Count on foot. Charming stories, but they probably aren't true, all the more disappointing since these stories bear another strong parallel to the Robin Hood legend, which of course features Robin and his men hiding in Sherwood Forest. However, it is true that Count Renaud eventually made an alliance with King Philip II of France, in part to help with his Eustace problem. Deciding that this was the time to seek employment elsewhere, Eustace hurried to the French coast of the English Channel and threw in his lot with the pirates who preyed upon English and French shipping in those waters. Because of his reputation as an outlaw, King John gave Eustace command of a pirate ship for raiding the French coast. Eustace must have been good at his new profession because he was in command of his own squadron of pirate ships by 1205. Eustace picked a good time to become a pirate. King John of England had recently lost his ancestral homeland of Normandy to King Philip II of France and he was determined to get it back. That meant constant war between John and Philip. As King John's man, Eustace raided the French coastline and split the profits between himself, his crew, and King John. Much pleased at the effective raiding and plundering of the French coast, John granted Eustace the Channel Islands, which he used as a naval base. Eustace became so wealthy from plundering French shipping and coastal villages that he was able to build himself a palace in London and sent his daughter to a finishing school for aristocratic young ladies in England, where the nobility was still mostly French-speaking. Yet Eustace was not satisfied with the tremendous spoils he earned. Around 1212, Eustace began playing both sides, raiding the English coast as well as the French. He even seized the coastal town of Folkestone in England and held it for ransom. King John was angered and briefly declared Eustace an outlaw, but eventually pardoned him, as John still needed his fleet to fight the French. 
Around this time, Count Renaud abandoned King Philip of France and allied with King John. His old enemy swearing loyalty to John was enough to make Eustace abandon John of England altogether in favor of Philip of France. King John was likely upset over Eustace's treachery, but he had bigger problems. In 1215, the nobles of England rose up against King John, angered at the high taxes they had paid simply so John could lose war after war to the French. They forced John to sign Magna Carta, the famous document that asserted the rights of the nobles and limited the power of the king. Though John signed it, he immediately went back on his word and raised an army to force the nobles to give up Magna Carta. Not relishing this prospect, the nobles invited Prince Louis of France to become their new king. Having thrown in his lot with the French, Eustace the monk had his ships ferry Prince Louis across the English Channel to take command of the rebel nobles. He became so renowned by this time that he had 36 knights serving aboard his flagship, the Great Ship of Bayonne. Throughout the civil war between King John and Prince Louis' rebels, Eustace continued to ferry supplies and French soldiers across the Channel. Then in 1216, King John lost the crown jewels in the wash and then his life to dysentery. And there was much rejoicing, followed by the crowning of John's young son, King Henry III, as King of England. With the hated John out of the picture and the revered William Marshall running the country, most of the rebels made peace with the crown. But there would be no peace and no happy ending for Eustace the monk, who in the eyes of the English remained a traitor and turncoat. In 1217, Eustace saw an English fleet coming his way and thus began the Battle of Sandwich. The English threw pots filled with powdered lime on the decks of Eustace's ships, which got into the eyes of his crew and temporarily blinded them. Eustace's flagship was attacked by an English ship commanded by Richard Fitz John. The other pirate ships broke formation to save their commander, but that only made them easy prey for the enemy. English ships used ramming, grappling, and rigging cutting against the pirate ships, and they soon won. While the nobles and knights on Eustace's ship were captured and held for ransom, the common sailors were slaughtered and thrown overboard. Eustace was dragged out from his hiding place in the bilge, covered with urine and feces. He claimed that he could pay a ransom of 10,000 marks, but the English refused the turncoat anything but a choice about where he would be beheaded. We don't know if he was beheaded on his ship or on land, but it ended with Eustace's head placed on a pike by a man named Stephen Crabbe. Indeed, the romance of Eustace the monk, which romanticized Eustace's life, concluded of his death, no man can live long who spends his days doing ill. The defeat of Eustace the monk at Sandwich proved important, for it meant there would be no more supplies coming to Prince Louis in England. Soon after, Louis was besieged in London by William Marshall. With no hope for relief, Prince Louis renounced all claim to the throne and went home to France, and England remained under Plantagenet rule for another 150 years. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.